Hey there, it's uh, Friday morning, I think, on the west coast of the United States. I'm in um, Berlin, Germany. I've been here for the 5th International Fascia Research Congress. It was um, the last three days, and I thought I'd just pop on and say hello. I'm trying to get more consistent doing some lives for you all. And, uh, yeah, so it's been a week since the last one. I wanted to just um, give you a little um, update on how the conference was. So, um, let's see, it's the fifth international one. It's always international. Um, it rotates uh, where in the world it is every time. So, um, it actually only happens every three years. It's not an annual event, but a every three year sort of event. So the next one will be in Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada. And um, probably maybe in the summertime uh, in 2021. So mark it on your calendars. Um, it's a great, great research Congress. So um, I went to the last one, the fourth one in 2015, and just really enjoyed it. And now it will be definitely, I will always attend if possible. Um, for me, the difference between going to a research conference and um, a normal workshop or something is just that, just that that's it. It's research. So it's a great way to hear directly from the scientists and uh, the people doing the studies. Uh, it's, a, it's a very unique perspective in that the um, people who attend the Congress, there's a huge amount of clinical uh, people. So physical therapists, athletic trainers, movement practitioners and Pilates and yoga, gyrotonic, Feldenkrais, a lot of massage therapists, a lot of craniosacral people, osteopaths, chiropractors. So it's just a really great blend of manual therapists and movement practitioners, clinicians, in addition to the scientists, the professors, the people um, doing the research. And it's, it's just such a great format to be able to get to know them, inform them of how we're practicing and what question what clinical questions we have and we like to have answered in the research and so um, it's really collaborative and I love that there's a, the other thing I love about the research congress is um, I'm not sure if it's like this for a lot of research congresses or maybe it's just because it's fascia and it's a relatively newer thing to study but um, I love hearing from the direct investigators themselves because um, I think sometimes when clinicians or anybody reads um, research um, especially if you don't know a lot about statistics or what makes a good research paper you know you read the abstract or you read how they did the research you read the results and the conclusions and then you take it as fact and you take it as like the end all be all truth and sometimes that is, not sometimes, that is a complete lost in translation approach to research. And I think um, hearing the study directly from the person who did it is just so enlightening because you really hear in their voice that at no point do they think this is the end all be all. Um, obviously, they're proud of what they did and they feel like they answered their hypothesis, but um, they end up having more questions, I think, than they do answers. And um, I'm a question sort of person, and so I really love see, being around that and seeing that. In fact, so I came to the Research Congress with, um, you know, I always have some sort of questions in my head that I wonder if I'll get answered. And um, I always leave every lecture <laughs> with way more questions than I do answers. But um, that's just how I am with my patients, too, when I work with a patient. You know, no matter their outcome, you know, day to day or within a session, I always end up with way more questions than answers. And so that's just sort of what drives me anyway. So, I, but I love to see that from the researchers is just their constant curiosity about how to look at things and how to answer questions and how to create, um, 
create a study that can help us clinically. Now, that doesn't mean I want to go do research because that's definitely not how my brain works, but I can really appreciate the um, investigative curiosity that comes from them. So um, this format this year was a little different than the last um, Congress. Um, the lectures were a little bit longer and um, so therefore we had a little bit exposure to less variety of research. Um, with that said though, the presenters um, are always top notch and it was, it was awesome. So um, I'm going to write up a blog post um, about everything with a little bit more detail like I did after the 2015 Congress, but I figured it was good to kind of go over my notes with you and check. So, hey Seth, let me read the whole question, hold on. So since manual therapy has minimal evidence, what kind of changes, how do I think? Ah, it won't let me see the whole comment. I wonder, I mean, I'm going to have to hold off on answering that because I can't see the whole comment. Um, but maybe if I log on a different device, I'll uh, be able to answer it. So anyways, um, like I said, I'm going to write, um, I'm going to write the um, blog post for all of you. Okay. So Seth's so question. Hey, since manual therapy has minimal evidence to mechanical changes in the tissue, how do you think certain treatments work? Actually, so that's a great question. And um, there is evidence that uh, manual therapy works. That's a lot of the presentations going out there, and they're really trying to determine it. I think Leon Tritel, no, uh, Jean uh, Claude Zimberto, who mentions it in his book too, and a lot of the ultrasound and elastography um, studies are looking at it, and they're looking at um, um, does manual therapy change the fascia, and it absolutely changes the fascia. So um, I think they're still trying to figure out why it changes the fascia, but it definitely does change, and um, different. There's not necessarily one type that there's not one type of manual therapy that they have concluded works better than others, but it is definitely fascia is changed with manual therapy as well as definitely changed with movement. So what is the definition of people that have less pain? How do you think certain treatments work? So what's the definition? Seth, I'm not sure what you mean by what's the definition. The definition of what? And uh, people have less pain for a lot of reasons. So um, pain's a funny thing to talk about only because, you know, there's a difference between how much nociception we're having in the tissue and then what our pain output is. So nociception and our interoception, our general well-being will relate to how much pain we're having, um, so our pain output. But um, that is definitely all affected with manual therapy, so in a lot of the research that they looked at. Um, I could get you more specific sort of stuff um, if you want to dive deeper in reading some of the stuff, and maybe after I synthesize my notes, I'll be able to answer those questions better for you. Um, at least lead you in the right direction so you um, know whose research to go to um, because a lot of people are um, investigating that. Um, what are the changes in the tissue? What the possible mechanism of the changes are um, and how it relates to people's pain. How so he says, if there's a true change in fascia, how come there's not usually adverse effects? I'm assuming you said, if it works, can you do wrong and destroy something? Everything with a real effect, mechanical, can potentially harm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what trauma, physical trauma to the tissue is, right? Like, you get cut with a knife and it damages the tissue. So 
Um, I'm sure it's possible. Um, obviously, in the research, when they're performing the manual therapies on pe on people, especially, they're not going to be doing it um, with the intent of trying to create trauma. But trauma is a normal kind of influence that. Um, inflammatory response is part of it. Um, it's part of actually what creates a lot of the changes in the tissue. So um, I think there's definitely adverse effects of things for sure. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting. That's a great, those are all great questions that maybe some of the newer research can help you with. All right. So I'll go back to my notes so I can just give, give you a general overview of the lectures that I listened to and then maybe how I can help answer more questions like Seth has um, in the following days or weeks. Um, so the pre-con I took, I took a, um, a workshop on uh, interoception and emotional health, and that was um, pretty interesting. I'm not, uh, I don't think I necessarily... Um, it's very similar to how I approach interoception in my practice with my people, my own practice. Um, but it was really interesting just um, hearing her thoughts about um, how it relates to um, some of the emotional health diseases and just some information about diseases. And um, she talked a lot about what's called the default mode network, just that our brain at rest tends to always go to the negative. And so things like meditation and um, interoceptive body work tends to um, um, help switch that default mode off, um, which is a helpful thing to um, improve your well-being. So she talks a lot about that. Um, and I'll, like I said, in the write-up, I'll give more information. Um, and then talks a lot about, too, how, um, some of the things that are related to our function is, uh, and interoception is our body agency, a body or ownership. And so, um, we talked a lot about that and what that meant because those are parts of interoception besides just sensing uh, what you're feeling that um, have a relationship to um, people's emotional well-being. Um, so we talked about how some people have to a lot like a heightened interoception, but maybe not a very good body agency or body uh, ownership. Um, maybe some people just have a low level of interoception. So how to kind of balance that all out. Um, yeah, but her talk was interesting and I look forward to giving you more detail on that. In the main session, um, we started off with hearing from Dan Lieberman. So, you know, he is an anthropologist. He, um, talked about the evolution of human walking and running and the role of the IT band and the plantar fascia. Um, it was a great talk, obviously on evolution, how we're born to run. Um, basically that our cultural evolution has out, has gone faster than our biological evolution. So, um, perhaps why we have problems, uh, like plantar fasciitis, this, those kind of things, because we, um, you know, as, uh, like we know from Philip Beach's work too, we stick our feet in a cast and then things break down. Right. And so, um, ideally those tissues have been designed to make our ride in running and walking, uh, more economical. So we spend less energy doing it. So, um, it was interesting how he looked at that in terms of ev evolution from apes. Um, basically, you know, with his, um, research, he's, basically like IT band syndrome and plantar fasciitis are mismatched diseases, he calls them. So, um, like I said, that cultural disevolution. Uh, Melody Swartz, she is a researcher in the lymphatics and cancer world. She spoke uh, about lymphatics and the inter interstitium. 
Um, and that was uh, really great to hear more about how the biology of the interstitium and the lymph channels work, um, you know, and continued to reiterate that it's um, an active flow um, and the movement of molecules and proteins are a big part of it. And so it's por so important and the best, you know, the best ways to um, support that, um, which I think a lot of us know or have heard is to move, to, you know, to move a lot, to breathe, breathe, and uh, to drink a lot of water. Uh, massage is helpful. Getting sleep is helpful from a lymphatic standpoint in the brain. Um, there was a researcher talking about the need to integrate um, biophysics with classical biomechanics and looking at the spine um, and how this may relate to um, fascia as an oxidic material, which is um, possibly uh, another sort of way of looking at tensegrity. Um, and uh, relating to thermodynamics. Um, and it was interesting because Mark Driscoll, who is a researcher at McGill University, he was actually um, the moderator for the um, entire conference. And uh, he was sharing how uh, they're integrating more uh, fascial stuff into the spine biomechanics lab up there. So it'll be interesting to see what all comes out from there. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these things that were less exciting for me um, and continue on. So um, the day two was awesome. Carla Stecco started out the morning talking about um, biology of the matrix, of the extracellular matrix, and just the um, discovery or the naming of a new cell in the fascia called fasciocytes um, that are responsible for um, making hyaluronic acid, hyaluronate, which is the substance within the fascia that makes it um, elast elastic and more fluid. The hyaluron is, um, in the, uh, some of the other proteins are what makes it uh, absorb, have so much water in it and be such a good shock absorber. Um, so, you know, her whole thing is understanding, when we understand the biology of the fascia, we can better then determine um, some treatment um, applications depending on where in the fascia we want to have an effect. Um, because those cells, whether they are fasciocytes or fibroblasts, um, they respond to mechanical stress. So what type of mechanical stress you're applying on the tissue um, will have to do with what products, what um, biology occurs in the fascia. So it's sort of like structure and function relationship. The other interesting thing she presented on was the role of estrogen and progesterone receptors in the fascia and the effect on the stiffness of the fascia uh, during different phases of the menstrual cycle. So um, that was interesting made sense with what a lot of us know that um, while menstruating and uh, during pregnancy that uh, women tend to be a little bit more um, hypermobile because the stiffness actually decreases in the fascia the collagen um, actually is a weaker collagen at that those times of the month um, so um, I'll give more detail in my blog post about the biology and how to stimulate the different biology to get different uh, responses in the structure because I thought that was really interesting. Um, a Dr. Neil um, Thies uh, from Chicago, I think, um, somewhere, I think Chicago, somewhere in the United States, he had a great talk. He is the, uh, one of the authors on the interstitium paper, and it was um, really cool to hear him talk and just very humble about the fact that he realizes that uh, fascia, the interstitium, has been talked a lot in um, 
about and already known very well in the alternative medicine world and the fascia research world and um, osteopathy and um, is looking forward to collaborating and, and treating things more of like a global medicine instead of so Western based. And it was just really cool to hear somebody talk about that. Um, but he basically um, had a lot of the similar conclusions as the uh, matrix biology that was found with uh, the stecco work and um, some of the lymph uh, work with uh, Melody Schwartz in, in terms of that. So um, he just, I really enjoyed listening to him and, and, and seeing him talk. So uh, Paul Hodges spoke. Uh, his was good. If you've ever heard Paul Hodges spoke, speak, he always is really great about um, connecting things to clinical practice. Um, and so he looked at um, pain and the motor system and um, linking biology to the biomechanics. So um, he was just talking about the role that pain has with um, motor control, pain has with inflammation, inflammation has with motor control, and what it means for rehab. So um, the biggest things here is that um, the biggest things he was he was here is like we know that pain has an effect on the immune function and inflammation um, and pain affects motor control um, but was not necessarily fully shown is if the immune or inflammatory markers affect motor control and so that's what their um, studies were working at, on and they excuse me so they're looking um, in the muscle in the fascia what happens and um, it definitely does affect things so it changes um, it changes the muscle in a few ways. It changes the fascia in a few ways. And so his uh, that his paper was really interesting that he shared with us. Um, and then the relationship to um, exercise and the relationship to the brain. So the biggest take home that he wanted to, us to get out was that different types of exercise at different parts of the healing or injury phases um, have a profound effect on the immune function and then their fault for the tissue quality and the motor control. So um, basically it comes down to exercise is key for an immune response as well as pain. And so it's what type of exercise and when, which I will share. And um, another uh, study that he presented is one they're currently doing, and they're about halfway through, and they are um, um, looking at the types of inflammation um, after acute pain instead of chronic uh, that's present, and then the outcome of that back pain. And um, right now, they're showing, which is super interesting and a big clinical practice changer for probably some people, including myself and including my own body, is um, that people with acute low back pain who have a high marker of general inflammation with a CRP or C-reactive protein, one of the inflammatory markers, um, actually had um, within the six months of the study so far, their back pain resolved and they still had the best outcome. Whereas um, people who had an incident of low back pain and then had high markers of uh, TNF, which is tumor necrosis factor, which is a different inflammatory marker, um, actually had a worse outcome, still um, had back pain, um, especially when paired with someone who was uh, clinically depressed so or had um, symptoms of depression. So it was really interesting to see the difference. And so his biggest takeaway from this research so far is um, generic anti-inflammatories at the onset of acute low back pain is disastrous, that it could have a very negative fact effect on the outcome. And so um, 
that was a big that was a big one. So either being able to test someone after back pain to see what type of inflammatory marker they have, which sounds like kind of a process and a pain in the ass and not possible, or to just um, rely on the exercise um, and how exercise decreases the inflammatory markers because it's um, a more it's not as, it's a little bit more specific, less generic, like a generic over-the-counter anti-inflammatory. So that was super interesting. Um, the next guy, um, Frank Willard, he is a uh, professor at um, an osteopathic school in New England. He was awesome. He talked about neurology of the spine, um, so anatomy around the spine and all the possible places that could be creating pain in the spine besides the disc because when you look at the literature as far as pain generating things in the low back or back only four percent of them are from discs so where else is the pain coming from and so we went all around the vertebrae and discussed all these um, nerves that could be creating these painful areas and all these structures that could relate to pain or um, have a pain referral pro pattern and it was super interesting and um, actually um, connected with a lot of the anatomy that I learned in the visceral manipulation work with Jean-Pierre um, and so I again I'm so grateful to have that manual therapy under my belt um, and it was wonderful to see pictures of the anatomy in a detailed with that with this uh, Dr. Willard. So I'll share more detail about that in the um, write-up so I can add pictures and get it a little bit more um, specific. So um, uh, one of the abstracts that was presented from, a, I can't remember his name, I apologize, but he is from the University of Mannheim, I believe, um, and actually won the prize for the, uh, I think the Yonda Award for the best uh, research abstract. I really liked it. He was um, looking at pain and... Um, specific to the fascia and how people describe their pain. And so it was really cool. Um, I am big about getting people to describe um, how they feel in general, uh, using words besides good and nice or bad um, or tight. And so um, because I feel like the better you can describe something, the more that it kind of dials in what the uh, tissue might be that is um, generating your pain, which could be helpful in understanding then how to treat um, what you're feeling. And uh, so, yeah, so that's really what his study did. So um, basically found that um, um, things that they categorized as deep pain related more to the muscle, uh, whereas fascial pain was uh, more heat or sharp related pain. Um, which is very similar to, uh, yeah, I'll definitely share more about that art, that um, research because that was a, one that I thought was really applicable, at least to my work. Uh, scrolling through some more. Oh, the uh, the other one, my notes on my other my phone instead of my iPad, but was a uh, doctor presented, I'm not sure where he was from, um, I think maybe New Zealand or Australia or something like that, but he talked about a new ligament found in the hip um, related to the canal that the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve um, runs through. And this is, again, one of those things that mirrored what we've learned in the Baral work. Um, this is a ligament that uh, the brawl work has taught us about and um, that we learned how to treat in the neural manipulation classes. Um, it's a ligament that I end up treating quite a bit. Actually, he presented two ligaments um, that are related to the canal and um, both of those ligaments I end up treating quite a bit on 
a lot of my athletes. Um, so interesting because in the lecture, um, Dr. Fleming, who was the moderator, was saying how it usually is in old people that it's a problem and blah, blah, blah. But no, I see lateral femoral cutaneous nerve entrapment in a ton of my athletes. And so it was great to, um, again, see the anatomy a little bit deeper and have people aware of the structure. Unfortunately, the article is written for a surgical journal. And so the treatment recommendations were surgical releases of the fascia uh, uh, around the ligament to uh, unentrap the nerve. So, um, however, you know, when you're writing for a group of surgeons, I guess that's what they expect. Uh, there is another way to help nerves not be entrapped through manual therapy. Um, so, um, that was, I really liked that, um, article. And it's just one of those things too, that's funny. It's like, um, even though, you know, the headlines kind of like the interstitium, when somebody talks about anatomy in a new way, or maybe names a structure that was not named before it is like oh my god a new piece was found in the body and it's like it doesn't necessarily mean that it was newly found or that it, it just all of a sudden appeared because you know practitioners who study the anatomy and cadavers and books and just in their hands very well like Jean-Pierre Barral he knew about it but and didn't care that it wasn't named because who cares um so that's interesting, you know, just a reminder that when we're naming ligaments, when we're naming, when we're naming stuff, it's just still that reductionist point of view of separating things into their parts instead of treating the body as a whole. And so, um, yeah, now it has a name, but it's always been there and it's attached to a lot of other stuff. So, oh, and for example, I forget who, oh, maybe in the Dr. Willard's talk, he was sharing how the motivi how it attaches down into um, the sacrum all the way into the sacred tuberous ligament. So it's like when you think about that, that means like the multivitae are the SI joint ligaments, are the sacred tuberous ligament, are the hamstrings, are the peroneals. Now we're at our feet. So again, it's like nothing, nothing is separate. And um, the more we can have good pictures of all of those connections and treat the body as a whole, not treating all the parts of the body, but treating it as a whole organism, the better off we're going to do um, with movement, with manual therapy, the valuation in our own bodies, like realizing that just because my back hurts doesn't mean that the only way to make my back feel better is through my back. Um, or because my hip hurts doesn't mean I have to do something in my hip to make it better. So um, understanding that if you give a little love to the body, pretty much at any part, you're going to have an effect on the whole. So, and that was a message that was um, echoed throughout the conference is um, obviously collaborating, working together, and then approaching the body as a whole organism. And whether it be from science or movement, from um, the clinical work that type of thing so <clears throat> that was echoed by uh, Sasha um, Chaitao who is uh, Leon Chaitao's daughter who is uh, one of the editors for the Journal of Body Work and Movement um, Therapies so yeah and they honored um, Leon he passed away re um, in September and so it was a really nice conference honoring him too a little emotional so anyways as usual, that was way longer than I was planning to talk. Not super organized, sorry, but I was just wanting to kind of look over my notes with you. Um, Seth, I saw you have one more question or a couple more questions, and John left a question, so I'll look. Um, how much pressure is appropriate to treat fascia and specific to layers? Um, I don't think that that has been determined necessarily. Um, and it depends on what kind of fascia you're trying to stimulate. So you're trying to stimulate the fibroblasts, or you're trying to stimulate the fascia sites. So fascia sites are going to have um, more of a stimulation, I believe, on a shearing motion, whereas fibroblasts are going to be more of like a um, longitudinal um, 
or compression. Um, but I'll see, I'll look through my notes and some of the abstracts and see if I can better answer those questions for you or see if they've been tried to be answered. Um, but like I said in the beginning, there's always going to be way more questions than we have answers to, and that's a good thing. Um, John, what are my thoughts on breathing? I see a lot of new techniques and strategies. Is there a technique that you feel more beneficial than others? Are we making it more complicated than it is? Uh, yes. <laughs> I have many thoughts on breathing. Um, Um, I'm not, I'm curious what new techniques and strategies you're seeing. Um, I think that there's, I think, I, uh, Ryan and I talked about this on last week's live, which I'll, um, I recorded and put on SoundCloud. So I'll drop that in the comments for you. Um, and maybe I answered it good on there for you, but I think breathing is like one of the most underused, um, tools we have in our toolbox from a manual therapy and a movement standpoint. Um, but there's so many ways you can approach it. There's so many different ways you can breathe. So it kind of depends on what your goals are with your breathing. Are you trying to use your breath to improve your mobility? Are you using your breath to help with movement? Are you using your breath to help with stability? Um, stability for what type of movement? Is it an easy body weight thing? Or is it a like max lift type thing? Are you using breath to um, have like an emotional release? Like maybe you're doing breath work and doing more like allotropic breathing. Um, or are you doing breath work to decrease your um, stress and kind of flip the switch in your nervous system to increase your vagal tone? Are you using breathing to improve your um, your uh, chemistry, your biochemistry in your blood to make the environment less acidic, to tolerate CO2 in a different way? Are you breathing to improve your aerobic fitness? So there's so many things. So like with any exercise, you need to have a why are you doing it? So once you know why you're doing it, then you can better pick which type of breathing to do at what point in your workout or what point in your prep work or what point in your day, whatever it may be. So um, like I said, John, I'll drop the link to that um, audio and uh, video from last week when we talked a little bit about breathing. And if you have more specific questions, let me know. Because obviously, yes, I've got a ton of different breathing tricks up my sleeve happy to give you a better answer so um hi junko um hope your trip to japan is doing good uh yeah so sas thank you for all your questions they're freaking awesome questions and i don't have all the answers but i will look at my notes hopefully give you a little bit more guidance when i write up my blog post um, and lead you in the direction of some of your answers if they're out there, um, which may or may not be fact. Okay, thanks for watching. Oh, also, I'm getting ready to send out my newsletter today, sometime today. So I'll drop the link to sign up in my comments. And if you haven't already signed up, make sure you do because I am doing some Black Friday Small Business Saturday sales. Um, and I want to be able to give you some discounts and some discounts uh, for some upcoming stuff. So, as usual, don't be afraid to reach out, say hello, ask questions. I love interacting. I love trying to be helpful. Um, hopefully this was. And I'll talk to you next week. All right, have a good Friday. Bye-bye.